It's a good way to keep it a record. And uh, so uh, this is the newest e-newsletter. You can get it on, on email tomorrow, but I, uh, we were proofing it today. And so we just made 20 copies in case you want one tonight, or in case you're, you don't have access to email and stuff, or you don't want to mess with it. So if anybody wants one, okay, would you like one? You know, might as well take them. There's a couple of comma errors in this. <laughs> I was told. I'm terrible at proofreading. Thanks. Uh, so one of these days, I think we need to have a contest by find the errors, you know, and you get two, two free nights in, uh, I don't know, Gorst or someplace. Is there anything <laughs> in Gorst? <laughs> in a kayak in Gorst, you know, <laughs> and I'll do it. Don't go at high tide. You know, I'll, I'll, anybody else want one? Yeah. Um, as you can tell, we talk a lot about the police department on this one uh, because I'm getting a lot of questions about the police department. In fact, only. <laughs> yeah. that would be our new chief. And, uh, and, I, and we just thought, you know, this might be the perfect opportunity to talk a little bit about the changes in the police department. And, uh, uh, answer any questions you might have. But I, I did want to tell you that this is so informal, it's so easy to do. Uh, raise your hand and ask your question and then we'll just go with whatever the flow goes with from there. You don't have to identify yourself, you don't want to, you don't have to give us your phone number, you don't have to live in Port Orchard, you don't have to uh, reserve your comments to one or two minutes. You can talk as long as we don't fall asleep or we don't try to run you out of here. Uh, so. Uh, and if you want to change the subject, if you get tired of the subject, you can do that if you raise your hand. So, uh, and we don't run you out of here. <laughs> you know, it's majority rule, more or less, or gang rule, whatever we want to call. You know, so, um, but anyhow, this does tell a little bit about uh, the uh, new, new chief, and, our, and we have a new commander, and we have a new officer, and the three pictures are on there. So that's self-explanatory, and... Um, we're thinking that these uh, these three folks and, of course, the rest of our department are going to do a stellar job. In fact, they have been, and they, they continue to do so. Um, and by the way, if you have a complaint, that's this is a good place to do that, too, because nobody uh, uh, nobody's going to take offense to uh, suggestions you know, or complaints. Uh, I'll try to find you an answer if you want to leave me a contact or something, you know, if I don't know an answer or if I don't, can't answer your question here. So anyway, um, I have several other council reports and I'll just leave them up here. There's, uh, there's the old newsletter, which is uh, May th 2013, and then I have a March Council Short-Term Goals and Update Report. Um, last year I was told that I don't put out enough information. So I'm putting out information. <laughs> I, I'm putting out lots of information. I don't know if it's uh, if if maybe it's too much, but we'll see. Nobody has told me it's too much yet. Uh, there's an April uh, e-newsletter. Also have a copy of that up here, or several copies for you. Um, the one thing I wanted to tell you about and, and give each one of you is a schedule of events downtown Port Orchard. Really important to us. Um, we're trying to rediscover ourselves and make Port Orchard a destination. And the man that's kind of tuning us up to do this, giving us instructions, says, if people that live here can't come, won't come downtown, you're going to be hard-pressed to get anybody else to do it. So we're hoping that we really, really can this year get lots of folks that live here to come down to the art walks and, and uh, you know, the, the various things that are on this list and on our website. So. I'd like you to maybe put this on a refrigerator or highlight it with, uh, oh, I have one. oh, you have one? Okay. A highlight pen or anything. Um, you've got one? Everybody have one? We're hoping that this is just the start of a lot of the activities that we're going to, going to be doing. Um, and when I say we, I don't mean we, Port Orchard. I mean we, the nonprofit groups in Port Orchard. Uh, Port Orchard Bay Street Association, really a dynamic group that's just catching fire down there. It's so exciting. Um, 
I don't know if I should invite you to the meetings. It's almost standing room only right now. Come anyway. It, it, you'll, you'll get uh, your batteries charged. It's once a month, and they're, they're coming up with a lot of cool ideas for what we can do for downtown. In fact, they already do a lot of cool stuff for downtown. They take care of the flower baskets and the flower uh, pots that are along the street. They take care of that. They put out the flags. Uh, they have cleanup three or four times a year. And you seldom see all of that, but they're doing it. And they're doing it voluntarily. So they're a cool group. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the Chamber of Commerce it is really a, an active group here in Port Orchard. And, uh, so, and, and you can join the Chamber of Commerce. You don't need a business. If you just want to see Port Orchard uh, you know, thrive, you can join a Chamber of Commerce. It is pretty reasonable. And come to luncheons and give your suggestions. So uh, anyway, that's when I say we. I'm, I'm really talking the larger we. I'm talking about all the nonprofit folks that work so hard for us. And of course, then the Fathoms of Fun, which are most of the people on that list. Uh, we're getting ready to do the Fathoms week before, uh, uh, what do they call the Grand Parade, which is the week in just before the 4th. And uh, so many things going on anyway. So okay, there's my commercials for Port Orchard. Uh, and, and I'll answer, try to answer any other question. And, and Kathy Michael is, uh, is one of the board members of the chamber. And she's also on Port Orchard Bay Street Association. So she, it, she could probably answer any questions you might have about. Beck is on those, uh, those, both of those also. Um, Port Orchard Bay Street Association has a wonderful new website, I think is pretty nearly all you're, <laughs> you're doing. And uh, so, and how do you get there? How do you, how do you, folks, the fast way to get there, find it on that? Oh, um, the, the Port Orchard Bay Street Association website is pobsa.org or com. You can get there either pobsa.com or pobsa.org. That particular website was designed uh, to promote the individual businesses on Bay Street. And you can find all of the businesses on Bay Street on there and what they do. Um, it has a complete calendar of Port Orchard events. It has links to our different government agencies. It has links to the ferry schedules. It has, I'm drawing a blank, we spent so much time on it, now I can't remember what all was there. Oh, yeah, yeah we have, like I said, we have an events, we have a, oh, and his fancy phone, I haven't got my glasses on for it, it does no good. Yeah, right, and we have the map. Um, yeah, with the businesses, their locations on the map. Um, is it aimed at consumers or other businesses? No, it is, it is aimed at consumers and it is aimed at tourists. It is not a website for the POBSA right now where you can go in and read their minutes or do those types of things. It is directed entirely upon uh, bringing in consumers and tourists. And we did uh, produce the website with LTAC funding. So that's why it is not to promote the association. It is to promote what's going on downtown and the businesses. And the businesses are not limited to Bay Street. Yeah, yeah, they are, we have a lot of other businesses. I personally don't have a business. I'm retired now, but I still am an active member. So. Um, Tell them what LTAC is. Oh, LTAC is the lodging tax funds. And we use those monies to bring, to invite people into town to do business here. What I will do, um, if people are interested, we just produced a new brochure and I have them in my car. I can go uh, bring them and that might be helpful. Yeah. I do, I'm the a marketing chair for the POBSA and we have got a lot of marketing going on right now. We are providing free rides on the foot ferry. We have marketed um, those particular complimentary rides at both of the marinas, Port Orchard and Bremerton, to encourage uh, foot traffic back and forth between the two communities. We have our free cards in the two hotels that are downtown Bremerton, in the museums that are downtown Bremerton, um, and some of the art galleries that are downtown Bremerton, as well as the Port Orchard uh, or the Bremerton Chamber of Commerce. What 
and, and I just got the rack cards. I just got them distributed last Thursday. And Saturday alone, we had 10 people use the uh, cards uh, on, the, on the foot ferry. Um, I don't have the count for the extended hours or Sunday, but the actual Saturday normal Kitsap transit hours, we had uh, 10 of our cards used. So that's really encouraging. I, that was a number that I hadn't expected for the, you know, the first day. Yeah, so I will. I'll go to my car and, and come back with the brochures. Okay, introduce yourself before you go. I'm going to see if the mic can go around. Oh, that would be good. Uh, my name is Beck Ashby, and I live here in Port Orchard. Um, yeah. And I am, I, am, I am running for city council. I'm running for Carolyn's uh, Powers position, which is position two. Thank you. This is very intimidating. Oh, yeah. 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 I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've never had a problem with that. I am um, a nurse. I've been a nurse for 30 years, and my lifelong dream is coming through uh, just on Bay Street, but I will not, unfortunately, it's not a, um, I'm opening up an adult family home. And so I'm going to start getting involved. I've been lived in Port Orchard my whole entire life. Never been to one of these meetings. <laughs> but I've worked in Tacoma, so I've been.
alone the criteria for that, they have to work a thousand hours at the CNA before you can even employ them. <laughs> so they're gonna, they're very skilled, they're gonna be very skilled people, and I thought for sure I'd have a my daughter just got out of CNA school, just graduated from South Kitsap, and I thought, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Her. No, she's going to Eastern to be a nurse, of course. So that that's fine, that's all great. But so if you know of any good CNAs that has at least a thousand hours, have them come look me up. Yeah. Janelle. Yeah, hi. Okay, well, now yeah. you get the microphone. <laughs> Unless anyone has any questions about it. Janelle, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I'll say some more about it or, you know, prompt you to let me say it because if they didn't hear it, it's cool news, you know? So, anyway. I am very, very, I could not be more excited about anything. And I just wanted to, I just want to be there. And, you know, I'm so anxious. I just want to have it done. I know what I want. I have all these great ideas. Oh. Introductions, yeah. or do you want just the whole thing? Yeah. Well, just, just introductions. Tell us, you well, uh, know, hi, my name's my name's Eric Connison, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're hi, Eric. It's hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Welcome, Eric. Welcome to the 12 step program. <laughs> I have well, a home yeah, for you. The three step program. <laughs> First of all, you have to tell the truth. <laughs> so that kind of ruins your story. Uh, alcoholics go to meetings. I don't. Uh, okay. anyway, um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I, um, I arrived here 20 months ago and lived here a total of 13 months between my first winter I spent back in Arizona and when I farmed last, this last winter. But I got back here so I could spend most of the winter here, see how I could survive it. I did. The big trick is that I've survived the springtime here with no allergies. I can't believe this. It's yes. just amazing. See, Arizona's a disaster that way. Oh, no. So uh, I just have had this clear at sinuses since I was 15. <laughs> this is great. Um, and how many people here actually live within walking distance of downtown besides you guys? I know. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Most, most people here. Okay. Um, how many? I live on, the, on a boat in uh, Sinclair in the Hyena. And uh, in my. Uh, I, yeah, I don't want to. Okay, I don't want to get into my whole thing. I just, um, but basically, well, I'm a native of the Seattle area. I grew up in uh, the East Side in Marysville, and then moved to Arizona. Worked in the mines there 40 years. Well, <laughs> worked there 10 years in mines, and then used aircraft for Raytheon, and uh, took my retirement uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. And went shopping for a boat to live on from Arizona in Puget Sound. Anywhere, and uh, the best deal on the boat and marina that I could find happened to be in Port Orchard. So that was me throwing the dart at the map of Puget Sound and winding up at Port Orchard. That's why I'm here. 
And, uh, but, uh, you know, please just stop me before you feel like throwing furniture. <laughs> but, um, but uh, I live around the town of Boat, and I try to, con and, oh, you'll see me riding my bicycle around. Sometimes I'll have a guitar strapped to the back. Um, but you'll also see me rowing around the harbor in the evenings, almost every night, or in the morning. Okay, I have a little Walker's Bay 8 foot dinghy that I roll around just every day. So what was your name again? Eric Gonnison. I also happen to be running for city council. Uh, What's your position? The at large position yeah. occupied by Jerry Childs um, at the present time. And uh, uh, I don't know, that's the introduction. I'll say the best for last. That's a mic recognizing the talking stick. I probably don't need it either. You don't. You know. <laughs> My name is Jerry Morris. I manage sound storage up on Bethel. And I settled here and I retired out of the Navy in 80, and I've been here ever since. Seen a lot of changes. Need to see a lot more. But we're glad to be in the city. We just need to have some work done. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're, you're, you moved here, and I'm glad you see that we do need help. And <laughs> actually, you just joined the chamber, I believe. Yeah. Yes, we did. Not too long ago. I yeah. remember your face. So yep. <laughs> you're into it now. Yeah. Now, you, now so. we need a more, than, uh, more than a little help yeah. to, to turn this around. But thank you. Where do yes, you sir. join the, oh, I'm sorry, but where do you join the chamber? Right now? here. Right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, She'll yeah. sign you up. Don't leave, I'll get all your information. Uh, my name is Mike Rowe, and I'm one of the owners of Sound Storage. And I'm here to learn a little bit more about the Bethel Road corridor project and kind of where that stands. All right, when, when we get through with introductions, uh, let's start with you with a first question. No, about yeah. That. Uh, Gil Michael, and with Kathy right here, <laughs> we own the uh, Cedar Cove Inn up on the hill. It's a seven-bedroom bed and breakfast. Um, each of the rooms has a private bath, have Wi-Fi, serve full breakfast. Uh, I mow the grass. Kathy does the garden. <laughs> the garden looks much better than the grass. <laughs> uh, that's it. She'll, she'll yeah, and he's been on the City Planning Commission for 17 years. He probably has attended more meetings than most of the council members. <laughs> been very involved in the city. Um, Kathy, we are involved with the Chamber of Commerce and very involved with the city and have some great neighbors that are also here in the room with us and people we've met along the way. So that's kind of us. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tadina Crouch. I live over on Hull Avenue, which is the other hillside in town, walkable distance. And I use that all the time. I'm on the Planning Commission again and spent 12, 14 years on it before. A lot of fun, very interesting, never a dull moment. One thing I'm concerned about is that in my neighborhood we have someone who is so well known that when you call CENCOM, all you need to do is give them the family name and they will show up and they never come alone. And it's a concern to me that it's a renter, and we need to look at what we can do to notify homeowners when renters are causing a problem in neighborhoods. So that's a concern of mine, and I'll let that one be the one for the night. Hi, I'm Fred Chang. I'm one of the council members. I live on Sydney Avenue, so I'm in walking distance about uh, two, three blocks. And um, I found this town sort of by accident. I was looking for a home in Bremerton that was historical. It was sold, and the agent said, oh, why don't you live in Port Orchard? You can take the foot ferry to Bremerton and then to Seattle. And uh, I fell in love with the house, and just everything else kind of worked out that way. Um, I'm very happy to live here. And um, I keep seeing the city as... A lot of people say it, uh, see it as the undiscovered jewel. Um, I'm not sure about undiscovered, but I keep thinking that it has a lot of potential. 
And uh, I, I see it as improving, even though improvement sometimes does seem to go backward. Uh, but I think overall, the, I, I do see improvements. And uh, I live in a neighborhood where I happen to know a lot of the people. And I like that feeling. Um, I wish we had a way to broadcast that to the entire city um, for those who want to know their neighbors. And uh, I just came to listen. <laughs> My name's Jeff Braden, and I probably live the furthest away from downtown as anyone here. I live out at uh, McCormick Woods, and uh, first moved into the area in 90 when I was in the Navy, and moved back into uh, McCormick Woods in 2002, and uh, we got annexed by the city, what year was it, about 2008 or nine, somewhere. It's been four or five years, yeah and uh, got involved in the city after that point. And uh, actually right now, I'm kind of happy that we're part of the city and I'm trying to get as involved in, in helping the city uh, continue to progress. And that's all I am. I'm Bob Jay, and I moved up here from uh, Barstow, California in 19, December 1979 Worked out at uh, shipyard for a little while, and then out at Subbase Banker, and retired. And I'm just enjoying living around here now. Don't have to live out there in all that hot weather in the desert. <laughs> I don't own any business, so I guess I can't brag about that. You can probably tell I'm his wife. I'm taking the microphone away from him. <laughs> I'm Loretta J, and we live on Tacoma Avenue, right. Uh, across the street from the Active Club. And uh, oh, maybe a year or so ago, we, the uh, great-grandparents, kind of complained that there were no benches over at that park to sit on for the adults while the children were playing. So not only do we now have benches, we have a brand new playground. It's beautiful. Uh, we have two great-grandsons, six years old and almost three. So, of course, now we have to walk over there because they don't want to stay in the house. They want to go to the playground. But uh, we moved inside the city three years ago. We came to the meeting Tuesday night just because I think there's a lot going on, and when we're sitting home, we don't really get a feel of what's going on. It's our city, we just want to know. So we're here to listen. My name's Jerry Harmon. I live on Kitsap Street, which is just two blocks from downtown. Um, I started coming to the city council meetings probably five or six years ago now when they were working on the downtown overlay district because I was upset with the, um, <laughs> the thought that the people downtown could take away our view, which is what, and I know that they can, but I was working where um, people can come in and make money on our town and leave and we're left with the mess that they bring in so I started attending the meetings and have I try to make nearly every meeting and study session just to keep track of what's happening in our our town and I'm my concern right now is about the idea that our town is going to um, put on the ballot and so many people don't work to learn about the issues, and in my um, mind, that going to a city manager and paying that person um, the amount of money that they're, he will demand. And I feel that we're small enough that whoever we hire will not stay very long. They will use us as a stepping stone. So it's not going to be beneficial for us. And I believe there's another woman that attends frequently. She has... Um, um, mention that she's been trying to do some research and she can't s find any place where it proves that having a city manager is more beneficial for your community than having a mayor. Um, I believe mayors buy in because they're part of our community. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's something that I'm really concerned about now and want to work toward uh, trying to keep us have a mayor instead of a city manager. I, I'm Chuck Chandel. Obviously, I'm with the police department. I've been with Port Orchard Police for six years. This is actually working in my seventh year. Before that, I was with Los Angeles Police Department for five years. Uh, I'm one of the field training officers for the department. I'm also the motor guy, so I'm the guy out writing tickets. Um, <laughs> Anyone who's hired on the department has to go through a field training process. I'm one of those training officers who, who sit in the car with them for several months and uh, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing in accordance with the laws and department policies. And, and I get to sign off on whether they can actually stay here and be a police officer. Um, it's one of my many duties. I'm also uh, on the Marine unit, do a lot of different things, ride bicycles, do all that stuff. Um, and I'm also happen to be uh, the guild president right now for the police guild. And uh, I came up here basically to answer any questions. If people have questions about the police or, or there's some legal aspect of what can we do and how can we do it, hopefully I can give you the answers so you're, you know, it just doesn't, well, we'll check on it. Maybe we'll get back, you know, try to get back to you. Hopefully I can provide any answers. And if not, we'll do the research and get to you and let you know what we can do. Hi, my name's Dana Harmon. I'm Jerry's sister, and I also live on Kitsap Street. We're kind of like the old family uh, way of doing things. We live next door to one another. Um, both Jerry and I are uh, the descendants of um, one of the founding fathers of Port Orchard. Our grandfather owned the uh, shake mill here in Port Orchard when it was first founded. And, uh, but we were raised in Bremerton, and it's, um, you know, after we went to college and all that kind of stuff, Jerry ended up here a lot, a lot sooner than I did, but I, when I came back from California, uh, my husband and I settled here in Port Orchard, and we love it. We think it's a wonderful place to live, and I agree with Fred. It, it, it's a jewel, and it, a lot of people don't know about it. I don't come to as many meetings as my sister does because I get frustrated with the current council not everyone but the majority of them and um, so I try to always come to Tim's meetings because I think it's important that people do have an opportunity to talk openly and unrestricted and bring up concerns that we think are important not just the city council thinks is important and um, I try to stay active and try to make, you know, the house and the yard and stuff look nice so it looks nice for people because we are downtown and a lot of people do come and park on Kitsap Street for all the events that are going on. And so we try to, I really, I just, there's, Port Orchard is a very charming place to live and it's, it's a wonderful place to be. I am a little bit like my sister. I want to see it continue to develop, but I want it to go down the right path. I don't think, you know, large buildings that take uh, the charm away from the city, not, not only the view of people who've been here for years, but the, the charm of the city. I mean, when you think about towns all across the nation that people love to go to, it's not the ones with high rises and condominiums on the waterfront that people go to. It's, you know, like Annapolis or, or down in California, Sausalito or, you know, even, heaven forbid, Los Gatos. I mean, they have wonderful, I mean, some people who own businesses say they don't like to be in Los Gatos, but I have cousins that live down there, and they love it because they have, the council has made uh, regulations about how things are built to keep the charm of the community. And they have what is called story, story poles. And so anybody, if they want to have vary from the city ordinance, they are required to put up story poles and uh, which will t show you exactly how the new configuration will impact the community. And it's wonderful. And my cousin drove me around and I took pictures and I brought them back to the city council and showed it to them. And, 
I was pretty much beat up that that uh, evening, um, you know, by bringing that suggestion to the town, because I think it's important to keep the charm of Port Orchard for us. You know, that was one of my uh, my uh, campaign thoughts were that I love Port Orchard, I want to help it, but I don't want to see it drastically changed, and I still don't. And I think we are a jewel. I think the jewel needs polishing, and I think the jewel needs a, a creative thought, um, something that maybe the council hasn't thought much about lately is creative ways of doing some of this thing. Um, and it's too bad that some of your ideas weren't picked up and, and, and really investigated because, and the same with a few things that you've said, um, that's how we're gonna polish this jewel and make it all our own is by getting it out there on the table and really talking about it and, and getting the best product we can. So anyway, thank you. Um, let's see, your first question, I think there was a police question and, and your, was, you, your first question was about Bethel Corridor. Okay. Uh, the Bethel Corridor came with a lot of baggage and there was a lot of information and some of it was misinformation when, when the Bethel Corridor was annexed. Um, in fact, uh, Gil Michael, who I, I would call him a, almost a historian of, of at least the last 17 years, uh, I go to him quite often, and he was telling me just tonight that uh, there's about 500 registered voters in the portion of Bethel Corridor that was annexed, okay? So uh, give or take, I would say probably six or 700 people, all total. Um, that when we were annexed, or the reason they, they were encouraged to get in there is because the, the, the word on the street was that we can fix that corridor where the county would never fix it. That was one of the things that really wasn't completely true because the county had a $45 million plan that they were trying to go around and find funding for. At the low end. And that's at the low end, yes. And uh, nobody out there in the county could figure out a way to fund a 45 plus million dollar project. But you see how wrong promising that a, a city of 12,000 could do that plan was at the time because it's simply not in the cards. Um, now we're stuck with a promise that we simply can't keep. Uh, there's no way that I know of that we're going to find 45 plus million dollars to do that Cadillac plan, I call it, which is the one that we got from the county, I believe it was 2002, was that plan was originated. Um, now what I'm trying to do is we're trying to sort out um, how much money is coming in from that, and uh, we've had to pay... Uh, the last three years, we've had to pay a share of the money coming into that back to the county for an agreement that we had. Uh, I think we just signed the last check on that. Uh, I did. It was a hundred and some thousand dollars. So now that next time we won't be sending that money up to somebody else. So that'll help us some. But a hundred thousand dollars a year is not going to build a, a forty-four million dollar project. Uh, the staff and I are going up there. We, in fact, we already have an appointment. We're all going to have the yellow or orange vests on, and we're going to go up there, and we're going to see what we can actually do with the money we actually have to do safety improvements. And we're looking at striping. We're looking at pothole and major uh, grind-out and repairs of bad areas. We're looking at maybe the intersections, lights, you know, traffic lights or something, and we're going to prioritize it. Lights on the poles. It's very dark corridor. And uh, we can do some of this, and some of this, uh, that's what we intend to do, is start doing something. Maybe not buying, uh, you know, tons of uh, easements, because that takes a lot of money, and, and it doesn't show up as being anything. You know, I mean, if we buy a, um, a $100,000 worth of easement, nothing looks like it's changed. We still have the easement, but we haven't even started building anything, so. Um, it's kind of a downer to say, you know, well, I just don't know how we're going to build that. Uh, I think, first of all, yes. Can't keep quiet. All right. That's <laughs> but my thought on the Bethel Corridor is this, is, it, um, is what 
Mayor Mathis has said is that the the traffic plan that the county has that they I think it was 2000 and revised in 2008 it's a 45 to 60 million dollar idea and I think the city needs to just go back and start over with that plan the um, what Tim is talking about right now are your basic safety improvements you know that's a completely separate issue we also we need to relook at the plan I don't know that we're obligated by law to complete the plan as the county presented it to us and I think we need to go back redo the plan find out we we can actually do the Bethel corridor is one of our prime commercial corridors that's where a lot of the city revenue is going to come is from sales tax money generated on businesses on the on the Bethel corridor so we before people can your corporations can develop there they need to know how much of their land is going to be given up in the easements or the right-of-ways they need to know where ingress and egress is going to be on that corridor so we need to go back to square one and it is a long-term project I mean there's even if the way fun, and, and funding has changed from the time the county originally did the project to now it, as we have learned on Tremont is that they tend to do it in sections rather than do all of Bethel. So we have to prioritize which part of Bethel is going to be done first and really what it's going to look like. Can you ask a question on that? What, what, what are your primary concerns with the Bethel corridor? Yeah. yeah. Well, <coughs> I guess you uh, so much. I, I guess I'll answer that with two pieces of it. One is, is just traffic. Uh, so as a business there, you know, trying to take a left or trying to get in and out of places is just, it's just a nightmare. So, you know, it, it's not an immediate issue for us. We don't generate a lot of traffic, but understanding longer term what the plan is for the traffic. Um, we would like to expand the store, but we really can't do that without knowing kind of what things are gonna be required of us and where our ingress and egress, as you mentioned, are gonna be. So, uh, you know, that would be our second um, reason for, for wanting to kind of get a feel for what's going to be happening. It's just as a business person, what should we be doing? What should we be doing long term to improve the store? You know, we're still on septic. Um, so, you know, there's some things that we've got to think about in knowing ultimately what's going to happen is, is would be a significant um, improvement for us in terms of how we run the business. One thing I will say in the county plan is, is and I've been around real estate development for, for a long time, is anybody who read that plan could tell it wasn't feasible. I mean, that wouldn't have worked in Bellevue, Washington. So, <laughs> no. so you know, um, but there is, there is a plan that will work for the community, I think. There's got to be. Uh, and, you know, I don't know what that is, but I think there was some you call promises made but there were some expectations that when that chunk of land and that those people got annexed into the city in part there would be some progress made as to you know what was going to happen to that corridor i don't know that anybody thought there was you know one specific solution going to be put in place versus another but certainly you know uh, we voted for it because as a property owner because we we wanted to see a solution put in place over some period of time. So that, that would be our. I think, you know, Beck's really hit on it, but the problem that many of us saw that, you know, really are involved was when the meetings were held and it was talked about bringing it in, all we heard was the, was the sales tax revenue was going to be 1.2 million. <clears throat> it wasn't until I think, four months after you actually were into office that the county came down and did an entire you know discussion of you know what you know what their projected costs have been from actually years ago and so i think unfortunately the annexation of bethel corridor very much happened from what you said i think there may have been possibility that business and property owners were promised if it was 
annexed into the city, certain things would be done within a certain time because of all this revenue coming in. And I know we never, in all the meetings that we were at, ever heard, you know, what it was going to cost. You know, we did, all we heard was, you know, 1.2 million in revenue, 1.2 million in revenue. And then, you know, when it's already said and done, to hear that there's, you know, it's going to cost, you know, 50 million <laughs> to do, you know, anybody would have kind of stepped back and said, well, wait a minute, you know. And um, there's additional problems, I understand, above and beyond that, because there are pockets that, of areas that are critical to the changes that need to happen that are still in the hands of the county and, you know, egress areas and things like that, if I'm correct. But yeah, it is a, yeah, stormwater. Oh. Yeah, so it, it really became very, you know, probably more of a burden than ever should have been, you know, taken on, but. Right. It, it, yeah. And we're and we're going to do something, but it may not be that Cadillac plan. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, when I saw it, I, I saw it in its entirety here about eight months ago, and I'm going, that's going to look pretty funny. Uh, it was 120 feet wide, um, and it's still going to narrow down right in front of Walmart to two lanes, and on the other end, it'll narrow down to two lanes, and everybody will go. Why is this beautiful road sitting here sandwiched between two lanes? You know, I mean, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So, but would you, but would you, would you say that 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 corridor or that part of the city plan is is probably as important as any? It is. Uh, Beck has the, 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 the idea just right, and that's what we need to go back in there as fast as we can, come up with a plan that can be done and be, would be affordable. And done it, and, and here's the other way. No plan now usually gets funding uh, in the numbers like 10, 15 million dollars. That's, it just, the evolution has changed now, and what we do now is we do projects that are segments. You know, uh, if you can keep it below a million dollars, a lot of times there's million dollars available each year to do something. But it's really hard to find 10 and 15, 20 and 30 million dollar for projects. Um, now, I want to throw you a curveball here. <laughs> because it, w it is on our priority list. It's on our radar. It's on the council's radar. But we also have a shovel-ready project, and it's a Tremont. Now, that's, that's shovel-ready engineering uh, Easements are purchased. Everything um, that can't be said for finalized. drawings are finalized. Literally, we could have the uh, a bulldozer out there moving dirt in 30 to 60 days tops. You know. Well, come to find out, the federal government has a block of money that wasn't used the last couple of years, and now they've told each state either you have a project that can go to work right away and use that money or we're taking it back. So right now we're, we're kind of on pins and needles because we're hoping that we could get $13.5 million of this federal money that's use or lose for shovel-ready projects for Tremont. Now here's the downside. Here's the curveball for that. If we do get that, we have to match that to the tune of about $2.3 million. The city has to match it. That's a lot of money for a city of 12000 um, we have a great treasurer who has burnt the midnight oil for a long time, and he has a plan, and we're going forward. We're telling Department of Transportation, anybody will listen, we can do the Bethel job. But there again, we're going to... Tremont job. Or Tremont job, I mean. But we're going to be expending all our bullets on that for the next 18 to 24 months. You know, and all, all of our available money. So if we get it... Based on what you've just said, and based on what we just discussed about the Bethel Corridor, would then the target for now be to get Bethel Corridor plan shovel ready? So when that money becomes, when those monies that you are talking about are out there, that that project now can fall into that same type of situation that you're talking about with Tremont. I just want to say that in my world, I can do two different things at the same time. 
Okay, so I believe we can complete Tremont and we can plan for Bethel at the same time. They are not mutually exclusive. Well, it's not quite what I was saying, but I, I meant to say that we're going to be spending most of the available resources to match right. Tremont. But Oh no, you're right. You're right. We we can have a, a, a the full plan in. Yeah, yeah. I would say f three. Wouldn't you say, Gil? Okay, I'm, I'm going back to what I started with earlier. One of the things that happened the other night when they were talking about the going to a, um, leaving a second class city and going to a code city and going to a city manager was that um, I, I don't know if he's a developer or if he's in real estate, Mr. Brown was quite upset and kind of nailed the council that they have been pulling the money that the city has been receiving and using it, I believe, in the general fund to cover other things in our um, town. Am I kind of correct? When the budget well, is... I haven't watched that tape, and I wasn't there. Close enough. You're, you're close but, enough. But, what, but there are additional expenses incurred by the city because of Bethel Corridor, such as, I believe, the Bethel Right, so right. That has to come, so that right. Has to come out of the right. Right. But but what I'm kind of um, it sounded like Mr. Clausen promised, at least that's what I took from yes, I that the city would not be pulling that money that's coming in from the Bethel corridor to use in the general, you know, other than maybe for items that need to be covered like, you know, having safety issues in that. But I'm also worried then if he's made that kind of, to me it was a, a promise, um, then where is the money going to come from for this city manager if they're not gonna use it out of there? Then what other projects are going to have not get funded because they want this um, city manager? So I, that's what I'm worried about is all of the manipulating money and they're going to start I would say within the next month or so, building the budget for next year. So being there and learning about the budget, I think is really important for the people in this community if you don't want to um, lose services and things that we want. Really, that, has, oh, that has not been really discussed. For those of us that have sat through almost every one of those study sessions, uh, it, you know, personally, I feel it's very unfortunate most didn't see it because it looked a little bit, my term is, like putting a quarter in a penny gumball machine um, as they were trying to figure out how this works. And this had been proposed before. Yeah. The, the changing to the Code City, okay? So this had been proposed a couple of years ago, but the proposal came in to go to the Code City, but to keep it as the same governance as we had with the mayor and a city council. This is a completely new proposal to go to a Code City, we're currently what's called a second class, which is just a state designation, but um, to go to the Code City now and change it from a mayor council to a council city manager 
and and in that case the people would not have the ability to vote for the mayor and that cost is tied to many things. One is um, the cost of it being put on the ballot and being part of the election. Then there would be the additional cost of bringing in a city manager that typically would be hired out of a professional city manager um, pool and not necessarily somebody that's you know from here local. But the real point here is that the cost of how you pay for that will not change from the way our mayor is currently changed. He oversees the departments and um, it and is paid out of how that is broken out. So part of it comes from water, part of it comes from sewer, part of it comes from stormwater, stormwater all these different areas, streets. So because he oversees all those different departments, and this is a real simplification, so what happens if you're going to bring somebody in now that's going to be making $100,000 more, then that money is going to come out of, has to come out of increased water rates, increased sewer rates, increased, you know, of those each areas in order to do that. And I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns we all have is, um, especially when and just coming off of this on the Bethel Corridor, we didn't really look at the cost and um, where it, you know, there's not some money just flowing in here that comes other outside of taxes and out of property taxes or out of the citizens' pockets. So that's a really critical point. I just want to say that the good point of it is at least you have a forum yeah. now. Yeah. At least you have a forum now where people, where people you can talk to and say, hey, listen, this needs to be fixed. I don't think you would have had that when you were, you know, in the county. So it really, I mean, there is a benefit to being in the city. For Bethel. Yeah. Absolutely. As long as that leads to something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you've got three people here that are very, very, you know, yeah, no, understanding I, I, of your, your plight and want to help. Yeah, no, I don't I don't live in the city, so I don't know all the you know history or the, the details of how the city's run or the proposal. I'm just curious. You know, what, what ultimately is the uh, ability for the city to say, here's, here's the process for us figuring out what, what we're going to do? You bought into something with an expectation based on that quarter being asked with your business. Well, we were there before the annexation, yeah. so, you know, yeah. we, you know, right. but I still think the city should be able to say, look, we're going we're gonna to do a plan, it's going to take two years, we're going to get input, what, what, whatever it's going to take. But to sort of not hear anything, everything's kind of on hold. That corridor is, you know, it just gets messier and messier every day just because everybody's kind of waiting. And that's I think that's a problem. valid point that really needs to be uh, stressed is that many businesses could expand or would, would, you know, do more for the city if they knew what was going to be happening to their, to that area. So what I just said was that two positions this last year were eliminated from the city planning department. Um, so I think those are funds that need to, again, I think those are investment funds because if we don't have people within the city planning department who can work on those projects, then they're not going to happen. Yeah, Kathy just said the Planning Commission is underused, which is a very true statement. But one of the one of the points that's kind of a bigger point, but it, it relates to Bethel Corridor, but it also relates to, to everything else that citizens want to do, is the City Council in Port Orchard 
is more of a reactive body than a proactive body or a body that works, establishes a plan, and then actually works to complete a plan. It's, it's a way of doing business, um, but what happens is, for instance, Bethel, uh, we've an we annexed it in the end of 2009, and essentially it's been almost four years, or it will be four years in November, that we've done virtually nothing to it. And the city council is the legislative and the, the policy-making board. So if you want something done, and I'd ask everybody here to at least tell one other person that you're associated with, that if you want something done, come down here and make a point of it. Mr. Brown made a good point, and one of the responses, or one of the ideas that uh, was brought forward, that he would get a letter in response to his requests. So what I, what I would ask is, is for you, you to, to grab some people and come down and say, okay, what are we, you know, we've been here, we've annexed this, uh, the potholes are getting worse, the alligator cracks are really bad, and what are we going to do? And, and ask them to put this in their budget to actually at least fix the potholes and then start with a plan. Don't wait for Tremont to get complete, but start the plan now. And, and Beck Scott, uh, and her point was right on. If this city can't do with seven council members, a mayor, and 78 staff do two things at one time, two major projects, well, I think we all know what the answer to that is. <laughs> So the, just come down and, and, you know, make a point of it. You know, be nice about it and tell them, you know, they're doing a great job, but what about this? You know. we, we just saw something really critical in this last council meeting, and there was a decision made somewhere along the line that now you were going to have to sprinkle properties if they were over five, if they were 5,000 square feet or above. And, and there were seven, eight people but realtors, the Home Builders Association, uh, contractors that came in and under their three minutes, you have three minutes before the meeting happens to bring up things you wanna have the council consider, three minutes for items not on the agenda. So if you've got you know, half a dozen business owners that are along the Bethel corridor that are saying, you know, when are you gonna do something, then they have to come because the public speaking and the business owners where the revenue comes from are the ones that can get in and say, you know, here's eight of us, 10 of us, whatever. We just want to know what the plan is. We want to know where you're going with it. That tells the council, this is where we want you to put your focus you differently than if there's just one person. Yeah, they'll, they'll actually supposedly do something because now there's a vocal force and they'll, they'll react to that. Yeah. So, so you know other business owners that feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. get them to. Bring them down here and tell them, you know, we yeah. want this fixed. Here's a, uh, I have three of these council short-term goal update report. It's not, it's not complete, you know, absolute complete report, but it's it'll help you a little bit. Um, you, we can chew gum and walk. You guys. In fact, we are. I, I, I'd like to tell you. <laughs> I'd like to tell you we are chewing gum and walking pretty good right now. We've got about a dozen projects in the in the queue right at the moment, and uh, and 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 we have really really good staff. By the way, I, I you know I understand some of the comments. I, like I said, I haven't sat and watched the the meeting uh, Tuesday's meeting, and I'm going to. Uh, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, but uh, I, I need to. But I understand from comments of staff was that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we got beat up pretty bad on a couple of items, but I, I needed to, uh, I'll need to look at it and then I'll respond maybe some way or another. But uh, staff is really great in this town. And no matter if I'm here, another mayor's here, or a city manager's here, they're no better than that very same staff. A city manager does not mean automatic success in any way, shape, or form. Because after all, the guy is not an engineer. 
We have an engineer. He's not a police, you know, police officer. We have police officers, and we have a police chief. The guy doesn't know what it takes to be a police chief, and he never will, or she. So the whole point is you have to pick the right people, which I think we are just 99% in the right place, and then you have to manage them properly so they're allowed to do what they do best, and that's be a policeman, and that's being an engineer, and that's being a plannerman. And by the way, our plannerman's really turned out to be a sharp guy. Uh, yeah, that was my choice. No. <laughs> no, he's a very bright young man, and he's really doing a good job. And uh, I go, wow, I wish I was that quick on the uptake, because he picks stuff up so fast. Um, in fact, I'm going to learn something tomorrow, because we're going to a meeting together, a three-hour meeting. And uh, I'm sure I will learn from that young man a lot. So anyway, we do chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> I understand we can't have a Cadillac fix for the Bethel Corridor, but how about a Model A fix <laughs> at, at Salmonberry and Bethel? Uh, yeah. I don't know how many times a week the Port Orchard police have got flashing lights there with three and four car fender benders. I come down there four times a day. And I realized Tremont was it is a priority, but something, whether it's a light, I don't care what it is, there's more damn accidents there than there is any place else in any other intersection. I may be incorrect about that. Well, there's quite a few accidents there. And but, I've been almost hit there myself, so yeah. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and it's just, you've got the shopping center there. The roads are misaligned. Uh, there's a bank that the grass grows up. The city's been pretty good about keeping that cut on the, what is it, southeast corner. But that is a, that's a bad intersection. I understand funding. I'm concerned with safety. Amen. I hate to see people get hit. I've been lucky. And sometimes I'm a little bit of a forceful driver, but you've got to be. I tried to get to work tonight. It took me seven minutes sitting there, and I wouldn't have got through if a guy hadn't have finally just stopped and let me go. So as I said, I just Sam want a model eight fix. I don't care about the damn cabinet. Sam and Barry and Bethel. That's, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, that's what we're going to go up there. The city engineer, uh, the new planning director, and the finance guy and I are going to go up there, and we're going to start going through and prioritizing what we would do if we had this amount, what we will do if we have that amount. And then we're going to talk to the council and get their buy-in. And, and we're going to start that process of, you know, and, and try to get back to you and let you know. Is there at Ghana's, and all I can add to this dialogue is, needs a bicycle lane. <laughs> okay. I hope that you do come to the next council meeting yeah. and, and say exactly what you just said. Sure, That's I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. My mouse no button hole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's my boss. <laughs> something else that I've been thinking about is, a lot of times people as individuals come and they say things to the council and I know that they can't react they need to work as a team to everybody but it's like the people say it and there is never ever any response from the council at a pr next meeting or you know two or three meetings down the line that they've even discussed it amongst themselves it, it's like you're talking to a blank wall up there because unless you come in like the realtors did last week and kind of they they see the sign on the wall if they make them so unhappy they'll be voted out basically is my opinion that um, there's no response to us and I know that some of us come a lot and they get tired of hearing us but it's still there's a lot of you know when people do come and I mean just the the one little thing on the um, the volume on on the tapes if people go to listen to them. A lot of people can't hear the people speaking. And we're sitting here at study sessions and I'd say nine times out of 10, we cannot hear any of the people that have their back to us. And it's been brought up, I would say at least a half dozen times to this council that people cannot hear them. 
and yet not a thing has ever been done or even discussed, I think, amongst the council at any later date and time. And I think that's wrong. And, and I heard, I heard you, and I tried to first use the bullet mics with little clamps. You know, I put little alligator clips on all of the bullet mics thinking we could attach them and then no matter where we went, they'd go with us. Nobody would attach them. <laughs> they didn't want them, to, I guess, to ruin their clothes. They, I don't know. So, um, but we have now a splitter system we're gonna try out next Tuesday. And we're gonna use the mics from up there and bring them down and we have a splitter system. And at least from the test that we've done, it should be a lot better for recording and for you folks in the audience. I still would love to have this kind of meeting or a similar you know, situation where we're all on the same level and we're all closer together, but so far I, that I haven't been successful with that. But I heard you and we're still trying various different ways, but we have to get, we have to get the sound right because the sound is what, you know, is how we can record this and send it out on the internet. And if it's, uh, in fact, one of the council people missed a meeting and tried to watch the meeting and said, that was awful. I couldn't, the sound was coming and going and crackling and, and you're right, you're right. We need to, if we're gonna do it, we need to do it right. So we're still working on it and I'm hoping that we've solved the majority of that problem. We'll see you next Tuesday. When people come and make a suggestion Somehow, just for the respect of that person, some place along the line there should be something, well, we discussed it. We don't think it's important. And I know you can't, it's, you've got a lot of things to do, but it's still, um, it's frustrating to come, and I can see it in the people when I'm sitting here and watching them, and it, it's like they're talking to a blank wall. That's so. right. What did my grandma and your grandma say? Look at me when you talk to me. <laughs> Look at me, you know. Act like you're engaged with me. You know, eye contact. Yeah, I, I think it's atrocious myself. I think we should be looking at our, our employers. You know, that's what we really have here is a room full of employers. And this is their chance to tell us, you know. Well, that's what I want you to do now tonight, so I won't say any more. Um, did you have any comment on no? Okay, uh, let's change subjects. Does anybody have a subject change? Although my issue is one for the police department, it's also a code issue. And we need to look at what's in the city code that tells the police department what they can and can't do about such a complaint. And a similar issue is one about noise, and I'm sure they get noise complaints all the time. But the code doesn't really tell you what good guidelines we have. And I'd really like to see the planning department look at those two issues. And I, don't, I see us getting those little issues getting lost in the shuffle of the big things that we want to have happen. I have a, a little pie chart here for some of you, and not everybody, but is anybody interested? It's a rough pie chart that shows where uh, general fund expenditures are going in the city. Percentages. And the general fund equates to about how About nine million dollars. Eight point some million dollars. Eight point four. Eight point That's what the thirteen budget somewhere right away. I always tell you eight point four, eight point nine, pretty soon it's real money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> that is real money, by the way. And that's a lot of it. No, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like, like looking at judicial and saying, okay, what does judicial encompass? We have our municipal court. We have our municipal court. It's upstairs. Uh, we have a, a, a part time judge, and we have five clerks, uh, administrative officer, and four clerks, or three, three and a half clerks, FTEs. Uh, and, and we don't try to cut them up up there or anything. They, they, FTE is a part-time worker, you know, does a half-time uh, job. But uh, anyhow, that's where that judicial comes from. 
And then we also have to pay out of that, uh, we have to pay a prosecutor from the county that does our prosecuting work for us because we don't have a, an on-staff prosecutor. So, okay. Well, and, and you know, a lot of people beat up the law enforcement, but uh, this is, we're really in a really good shape compared to a lot of small towns. A law enforcement eats the majority of your expenses. They're out there 24 hours a day. They have some of the best and most expensive equipment, but they need that to do their job. So, you know, uh, anywhere you go, you're going to find that law enforcement takes the largest chunk out of most budgets. Not anymore. Not anymore. This, the fire department used to be a city function. Uh, it changed, and now it's uh, 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 South Kitsap Fire and Rescue. They get a percentage of our levy rate to operate, but we don't directly pay them. But we lose a percentage of our levy rate for them to, to be in business. Community development will be the planning department, and uh, no, public works would be roads, uh, plowing snow in the winter time. Uh, parks and public works kind of work together, and, and this—that's why I say this is a pretty general chart, because what we're trying to do is break it out into actual uh, work sections. Uh, city streets, parks and recreation, and public works are all. One, yeah, but it's trying to break them out to show you where we spend it in those in that department. Yeah. So community development is the primary function. Basically, yes. And permitting, and uh, working with the planning com uh, commission, uh, that those sort of things. I didn't mean to get us off subject, but did we get your question answered? We probably didn't. The city needs to have the planning commission look at those kinds of issues to bring that code up to date because it's old or non-existent. I think somebody else had a comment that the, the planning commission itself has been underutilized. And uh, you're right. It's a, it's, a, it's a really cool resource that if you don't take advantage of it, what good is it? I mean, you know, it, they, we have a lot of talented folks on there that could be doing a lot of this work, um, i.e. that work, preliminary work on what's the new plan going to look like. Um, see, I keep, when I hear planning I, or engineering, I, I, I think of a lot of money because a lot of money is, is being spent on engineering. But we don't even have to worry about engineering until we have a plan. And so the plan can be done. Uh, with council blessing and with council's direction to, to go back to the planning commission and say, we need a plan here. Yeah, we, we, did, that. we did that for pottery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So, I'm all in favor of that. I really am. That, you know. So, those of us kind of been around, we know that one of the things that changed under the previous administration was they hired a city hearing examiner that took a quite tended to take quite a big cut supposedly out of what the planning commission did so i think maybe part of what you're looking at trying to make happen is we understand there may not be money here for now but you we understand you've got a planning commission and if you get seven or eight people coming say you know get them working on this get them formulating a plan that's your opportunity to be able to come in and the Planning Commission hears the public input and be part of that process, but the Planning Commission's 100% volunteer. The, they look at the codes, they look at the laws, they, they have a, the city planner sits in the meetings with them, so they have that, that professional oversight. But again, it's sort of like what happened with this fire system, <clears throat> sprinkler system, that it is, if you bring seven or eight people in, 
the, the council will say, wait a minute, we've got a section of the community that's really involved in this, and they're recommending, you know, saying, I understand you have a planning commission that can do this, it doesn't cost you anything, and start putting the pre-plan together. Can you go ahead and at least start doing that? Because we know it's not costing you anything. So um, public input's huge, and he's on the planning commission. So. The, the one thing that you're going to run into is that since the community development department, and that was mentioned a couple times here, uh, and, and Beck said, said, and she's correct, that two people or two full-time employees uh, were cut out of the planning department. The planning commission itself doesn't actually do the planning and the typing and you know the minute taking and all the the actual staff work and formulating the plans but what we do is facilitate the meetings with the public for instance and we'll take Bethel Corridor because it's a, a great opportunity for the Planning Commission to work is we would hold a series of either monthly meetings or special meetings to actually poll as many people in the corridor itself or the city to say, you know, to ask and then the, you guys would tell us, okay, what do you want this plan to look like? Here's what we have, what do you want? And then staff would take all of that work and say, or all of that input and say, okay, here's the modification to the county plan or we're gonna scrap 90% of it and basically start over but what what you're going to have to have is the funding to pay for the hours that staff is going to have to spend to do that and in, and, and unless that is in the budget it's not going to get done so my recommendation is and you've heard it mentioned I think Jerry mentioned it that the budget for next year is going to be starting in July and the first part of that is the people the mayor meets with the department heads the department heads come up with a with a preliminary budget but it might be good for the people that are on Bethel to say we want something done and get this plan moving so could you guys find at least a half time equivalent yearly employee, you know, a half-time employee, uh, which would fund somebody to work, you know, around 800 hours on it or so, that they could do the background work. Because you have to have it in the budget for the work to get done. And personally, I don't want to be sitting here next year at the same time having this same discussion. And I, I want something done down there because I get tired of running, th running around trying to miss the potholes that are down there and waiting at Salmonberry. <laughs> it is a pain. Well, I almost think there's two subjects. You know, but I am, we need to start the plan over or at least evaluate the whole thing. And the second thing is fix potholes and safety right away. That's, I, I, that's what I was talking about. My first plan is to take, go out there and find out what we can do. And that's... You know the, the collisions. That's the potholes. That's the striping, and then get the plan going. You know, you or st at the same time. The plan to get somebody working on a plan. Yes. Yes. You know, and the mayor gets the first the first go around at the budget and then the council gets a hold of it and they may make changes to it but yeah I I can see where Alan and I can sit down and sharpen our pencil and come up with a figure that does this now whether it survives the end of the process with the council I don't know I can't tell you that because some things do and uh, some don't you know I have to tell you that some some don't make it or some don't make it in a smaller rearranged version you know but uh, that's a public process. Uh, the, the, the budget process will start in earnest in August, but we're starting in, in next month. 
we're already looking at preliminary numbers. We're a little bit far out because we have to make a lot of projections. And the closer you get, of course, to the, uh, the, the, the month is better to make projections. But we're still trying. We're still starting to formulate a plan. And uh, so, yeah, it's true. We can, uh, we can put something in the budget and then see if it survives the budget process. I don't, I don't know all the rules and regulations, but I vaguely remember it living in other communities and when uh, a certain intersection has X amount of accidents per cycle, there's usually re a requirement either for a light or stop signs, so like a four-way stop. Does the current city regulations have any kind of guideline for uh, an intersection that has so many accidents that, that they're required to act? Yeah. With, with all that, all of our collision reports go to the state, and then the state, when they start hitting these benchmarks, they start looking more and more at what those issues are. Unfortunately, most of their attention gets put towards the state routes and state highways, but it's also information the city has available. We can pull up at any time how many collisions have occurred in a certain area that were reported to us, but it's still essentially on the cities and the counties falls back on them to look at them and do the traffic engineering surveys, and, and, and go over all that data and then to come up with a plan to deal with it. But you, you have made a really good suggestion and, and I, I'm going to talk to the chief and see if we can come up with the dirty half dozen intersections or areas that have the worst, the worst accident. And, and that would give us that, you know, and we can do it on our own city streets because I agree with you, the state's going to talk mostly about state highways. And uh, although some of those may be uh, a culprit, but because of the higher speeds on a lot of state highways, the trouble with it is you can't tell the state what to do, but we can prioritize. So what you're saying is you'd like to see that. I would too. Why don't I try to get that and get it to you or have it at the next meeting or something? That, that data is available, uh, you know, so. us without roadway um, I mean, when they came in there at minimum I was hoping they'd see a left turn lane going up there to help minimize a lot of that problems because that's where we have a lot of issues where someone wants to make a turn they don't stop and they get rear-ended uh, Salmonberry that's nothing but a bad situation all the way around because you have limited view you have people driving at high speeds you got poor road conditions poor lighting conditions there's nothing good about that intersection it was a headache for county it's a headache for us um, so, unfortunately, there's really no easy answer for, for those ones. But that data is there, and it's something we can, we, we can get access to at any time. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's something that gets our attention. You get our support on improving those areas 100%. Um, you had some questions when you were talking about up there on Hall. Um, there is, and I wasn't... I wasn't ignoring the whole question, and when you were talking about it, I was actually sticking my nose back in the city municipal code to see where, if there was anything in there that we can, we can deal with this law enforcement. Unfortunately, some of the, the, a lot of the laws in the municipal code uh, that's written, there's some things in there for abatements and unkept property and whatnot, but that all falls underneath the code enforcement. 
Um, when we get called out to noise complaints or, or fights, unfortunately, we're dealing with the criminal aspect of it. And we don't have the ability, if, even if we go there and arrest someone and they're a renter, we can't kick them out. There's no way for us to get them out of that, that because then that falls back to landlord-tenant laws, which fall under the state of Washington. And there's a whole bunch of things you have to go through on that. And to, to get a landlord to take any action against them, we would have to show that they had knowledge of what was going on there, they're, or they're allowing criminal activity to occur. Other than that, um, you know, you just hope you have good landlords who say, I don't want this going on on my premise and I'm going to kick them out of here because I, I don't want my property destroyed. Um, the only other thing we can do is go through our, our code enforcement officer here, Kathy, Kathy Woodside, and she doesn't fall under, the, she's not under the police department. But we work with her, and if there's issues like they're not keeping the property up, there's safety hazards or there's health hazards, that's when she gets involved, and the city can put some pressure, a little bit of pressure that way, but there's only so much they can do. Um, as far as any noise ordinance or whatnot, most of our noise ordinances fall around the loud music coming from the car driving down the road. So we don't have a whole lot of recourse we can do there except for going up there and tell them, you know, turn it down, get it under control, or we're going to give you a, a civil infraction, or at the very most, we might be able to push a, a, uh, a disturbing the peace kind of a thing. But those are those laws are very specific in when we can use them. And unfortunately, you know, even some of the stuff that we had downtown when people are fighting, you know, we we try to arrest them for disorderly conduct, and we got a prosecutor saying, well, that really doesn't apply because there's an element they were out blocking traffic. You know, they were just standing on the sidewalk getting in a fight. Um, but that's one thing we did do in the city many years ago. We made our own city fighting ordinance, which is a wonderful thing, works really well for us because we can get anyone who's involved in a fight or participating, cheering it on, egging it, or even saying words that would cause that kind of physical reaction. Okay, you're, now you're under arrest for fighting, and that has worked very well in the city. So that's something... If the city, if it was brought up in council and, and the city attorneys got on board writing a specific noise ordinance for that deals with housing and whatnot, that that's, would be an avenue. But, uh, and that's something we could enforce because a lot of the, like I said, the code enforcement, the abatement laws and the, the property laws, we don't have the powers law enforcement to deal with it. It falls back to code enforcement. There's a whole bunch of steps they got to jump through in order to take any action on their side too. Give us better tools to deal with it. Right. Other cities are saying we're going to notify homeowners and we've been notified three times and we still haven't done anything and we're going to start charging you a fine for right. not taking care of it. And how can I continue to get this Section 8 housing? And even though I've called the homeowner because I'm scared of getting my money. Right. And unfortunately, that's the problem with some renters. Yeah. I saw, I know exactly what you're talking with. Coming from Los Angeles, we had all sorts of laws down there that we had a lot of lot of things we could do as law enforcement. We could cite property owners. We could cite renters or rent the, the landlords if they weren't keeping up their property, if they were allowing this kind of activity. There was a whole bunch. Of, we had a lot of teeth down there. And there were some laws you just shake your head at and go, I can't believe this is on the books, but okay. So... The more I deal with things here in the city, the inside of them, you know, the, the nuts and bolts day to day, the more I respect the job you have to do. Because it's a tightrope walk every day to make sure people have their rights and they're not abridged or they're not, you know, taken away, but that you can be able to do your job too. You have to be a lawyer and a, a pastor and I don't know what all else to, and to snake through there. And parent, counselor, dog catcher sometimes, you know, a psychologist especially. So it's not an easy job. It's, it's one of the harder jobs you can volunteer to do. Oh, Beck, are you? Well, I'm just rocking brochures. Um, these are the new, and again, these are designed not necessarily for residents, but for tourists. And they have been distributed 
right now, just in the south end in Gig Harbor, we've put them in um, various real estate offices and hotels in Gig Harbor, and we're in the process of, uh, yeah, just a second, let me, did we get enough to go around? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we are distributing these outside of our area, and it's an invitation for people to come in. There is the same list of upcoming activities on the inside page that um, Mayor Mathis had passed around earlier. But this is just one of the pieces that the Port Orchard Bay Street is, is doing to encourage people. That is Bob Abel in front of the new, um, the new wall. Oh, that's Bob right inside? Yeah. And the other thing that the POBSA has been marketing is the extended summer foot ferry hours. The city f and, and the city of Port Orchard, the city of Bremerton, and the Port of Bremerton are actually funding the extended hours, but the Port Orchard Bay Street Association has been marketing and letting people aware that the extended hours do exist. And, and the, the bags are actually a chamber project. I serve on the Shop SK First Committee, and those are um, one of our giveaways. Yeah, they're very nice bags, and it's a reminder that our mantra is to shop South Kitsap First, Kitsap County Second, the State of Washington Third, and the United States Fourth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My goal is to have so many places for you to shop in Port Orchard that you never have to go to those other areas at all. I just have a question for Beth, and that this probably, I just saw on the bottom of your uh, one tour, cash only. For and standard hours, that's correct. But uh, we go maybe once or twice a year, and I've never noticed any signs up above but until you get down to the ferry where the ferry goes. And for people coming in, normally there's nothing there that indicates that you need not just cash, the exact change. And I think of it at the time, I think there's something that should be done about this. I go have a good time, I go home and I forget about it. So this is just my reminder. Oh, excuse me, let me let me just talk to two points on that, is on the Port Orchard so side, there is a sign as you start walking down that indicates what the fares are and the hours, and, and I, I don't know if it says exact change, I can't remember, but I know on the Bremerton side, it's all the way down, but just, I'm just making an assumption here based on the color of your hair that, um, yeah, well, you, I know I qualify for the senior ORCA card, and you can uh, purchase it. They are, they are. But you can purchase those, <laughs> you can purchase those at um, the Kitsap Transit Office in the ferry terminal, the Washington State Ferry Terminal in Bremerton, and we get to ride the ferry for a dollar instead of two dollars but not for the extended hours. And it's because they're managed by two different groups. And, and that's the difference. And all of our marketing material, we tried to put on here that it was $2 and it was cash only, and that the ORCA cards were not good and, that, and there's no transfers given. That just triggered it. Mm -hmm. Something that I think that we all need to keep with the, the council is um, saying that the ferry has to be given a chance and one year is not enough time to prove itself. Because when I first moved here, that ferry went until two in the morning. And we'd head to Seattle, we could go to a game, we could come back 
and then go up, come back across. And right now it's based on the union has it where if the ferry's running and Kitsap Transit is involved, then the buses have to be running. And somehow we have got to get it where they're disconnected. But we also have to convince the council that one year is not enough time. I mean, you give businesses, what is it, five years to get on their feet? Well, this one needs some time to get on its feet or it's, you know, they're only wanting to give it a year and it needs more time. Well, and it also needs to be consistent. Right. You can't run it till 2.30 on Sunday and yeah. different times. It has to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just a business. I have to slow down. Um, in order for the ferry to truly be successful, it's exactly what you said. When I was a kid, it well, the hours were the same, the hour and half hour here, quarter and three quarter hours in Bremerton. It was 25 cents, but it ran, to, yeah, but it ran to two, and, and it ran seven days a week. There was never a question. And now we run it, um, you know, we have odd hours, we have different hours, and, and for it to, to be successful, it has to be consistent. There's just no doubt about that. So get on Friday, Friday nights after 9. <laughs> and Saturday. <laughs> so we get the ridership up, you know. And the um, part of the thing with the Bremerton is their farm, the reason it's running on Sundays is that's their farmer's market. So, you know, grab your cart, go down, go over to their market, and come back. I mean, we also want to convince Bremerton that they need to step even more up to the plate on this and they see the benefit. So there's a lot of stuff going on. The, the, the point that the Port Orchard Bay Street Association has made with the downtown Bremerton Association is that right now in Port Orchard, we have two or three, res three restaurants. I'm, I'm, well, four. Anyway, we have, say, less than six restaurants. And Bremerton has you know, maybe three or four restaurants. So if we can just let people know, come down to the area and you have an opportunity to choose from maybe 10 restaurants and they're just 10 minutes apart, you know, you have a, a, a better selling feature. And we've got two theaters in. We've got the theater here, we've got the theater in Bremerton, and we really want to make that seamless and have people come back and forth. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, we'll stay here if you want to stay longer until you're, you, you're not going to go until the cookies are all eaten anyway, and there's still a lot of cookies. Okay. <laughs> but if you need to leave, uh, that's good too. You know, like I say, it's really not, you know. Well, um, please let me back up to, and and back up to the time when I, before I was ever a candidate or even thought or suggested I'd be a candidate, I want to go back to the day when I came to this town as a customer. I came here totally from another place. I have lived in all four corners of the country. I've never been a tourist. I go someplace because I got a job to do or an honest goodness reason to be there. I've been either registered in schools, had jobs, on payrolls all over the country in Kwajalein Marshall Islands. I've had, I, I mean, I've, I haven't been all over the world, but I've been in enough places. And I know when I'm in a town and when I'm not, okay? So I live here now up most of a year, over a, at least a full year. And, and the first thing, and after a while, I just started to realize, where's the town, okay? Um, living on the water. Okay, I've tried to confine my transportation needs to using a bicycle. Okay, so to get groceries, I got to get back in my car to go up the hill to the grocery store. This is absurd. Okay, now, um, okay, and and the basic image that I get of the downtown is of something very closely, almost to the point of being like a red light district. There's, there's a half dozen bail bonds places. 
There's at least three or four tattoo places. There's a saloon, and there's some overpriced restaurants, okay? There's no coffee. I don't drink, so I don't, uh, there's, there's no coffee shop, at least until January, after January 5th, there's no coffee shop downtown, okay? And, okay, and I'm just going to tell you this is, this is a bad impression, a bad impression coming from somebody from outside of your town, okay? You, all you people have been here your whole lives and second, third, fourth generations, you're accustomed to this. This is no news to you. This is just business as usual for you. But to me, this is a pathetic excuse for a town. And, and, and I don't feel welcome here. If I'm, if I'm walking down and all I see is bail bonds places, all I'm seeing is, is this, this suggests criminality, a lot of criminality. There's a lot of convicts or somebody going to and from the, the business establishments here, and I think that's a lousy impression to have. And what I'm going to tell you is that this is the self-portrait of the people that have been running this town. This is your self-portrait of whoever's been running this town for the last however many years. Because I understand it's been this way for years, okay, many years. And, and that Walmart and Fred Meyer were able to siphon the, the basic life out of this town. This is a syndrome that is known all over the country. You hear about it everywhere. That Walmart has the privilege of coming in and just light and just soaking the life right out of the town, and the poor little towns are have to scramble or, or go or just become ghost towns. It's a common from sea to shining sea. And and one of the th one of the things that um, is is has also become apparent here is a, is a thing that I'm just going to call a lousy attitude. There's, there, is a, there is a cartel, or there's a body of people here who happen to be out of office right now. I'm not going to mention any names because I know they're going to pop right up in your own brains, okay? But I actually got to meet the guy face to face about two or three days ago when I went to the Home Builders Association meeting, okay? And he had the gall to tell me that he, uh, he lost the election by five votes and he... Uh, never would say anything negative about anything that he says he said that he wrote a column right away after the election say let's all pull together and be friends okay well i've got documentary evidence of what he actually does do and what he actually says and it's in his april uh, see april and may um column in the kitsap business journal whatever it is well who's ever it is this is this um, where he referred to what passes for management in the city now, okay? Um, and I think we know who we are. Yeah, what passes for city management these days? Um, and, he's, and then he comes out and he sneers at um, a fellow who is a used car dealer, owns a hair salon and a down-down bar in a sneering, derisive tone, Okay? Okay, uh, and then, um, and then he refers to a certain um, prominent person who's trying to reform things here as a puppet master. Okay, it's right here in black and white. I'm not making it up. Okay, well, okay. When I discovered, uh, when, I, when I formulated this question of where is the town, I, the first person I thought to go to was the top, the, the mayor. Okay, and I happened to uh, me. Uh, it, he appeared at the church that I go to, just out of the blue. And I, I oh, you're the mayor of Port, Port Orchard. Well, pleased to meet you. I was, and uh, <laughs> so he, I made an appointment to go talk to him. And uh, so over time, you know, I got this feeling that, yeah, he's, somebody is trying to do something here. Um, there's, there is hope. And he described the history of what had been going on. And, and I, uh, I just was, was highly encouraged. Um, by and uh, Mr. Michael, and I had become acquainted with uh, um, Steve Siegel. Okay. And I see people who have a good, solid background. And, and, and one of the things that impressed me about Siegel was his, his broad base of experience around the world in civic matters, in public policy issues. He's, 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 he's like a PhD in this subject at least by my understanding. He doesn't have, I don't know what his credential is, but it, it, his understanding of this kind of thing is, shows that he's, he's really done his homework. He's really, very highly experienced and highly, um, has, a, has a real good track record. And uh, so 
but so I certainly I was encouraged to become a candidate for city council by these people, by mayor, the mayor and, and uh, Mr. Siegel. And, and then over time now I started to get familiar with coming to the council and seeing this blank wall of stairs that, 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 that form the, the, the body that is, is the governing force in this town. And no wonder it looks like this. It's no surprise here. Um, so, you know, and so I'm backing up as a customer and I'm saying, well, do, am I buying into this town? Am I going to invest my time on the rest of my life or my, and, and, you know, my resources and try to make a go of things in this town? And I want to see some hope. I want to see some reason for it. Well, um, the next big thing for me is, is, well, I don't know how big it is because this city manager thing, um, I, I've, okay, I can go back to my experience living in Tucson. Real easy matter run by a city manager, not run well. It's a three-ring circus, okay? And then when I got up, and, and there were these things where, situations where they, they, they'd try to fire him, and then he'd, he'd have to, they'd have to pay him a huge, you know, buyout package, severance package, to get him out of there, okay? This happened more than once. And, uh, and it was just a farce. Well, when they had perfectly good governance with, with a regular mayor before. And then I got up here, and I met a lady over here in... Uh, just a few weeks ago in uh, Bainbridge Island. And she told me this, the horror story over there. Three city managers in three years? Is that right? Give me a break. Well, let's try it here. We're just dumb enough to pull that off here, too. <laughs> you got to be kidding. Oh, and, and guess who's pushing for it? Larry Coppola. Did I pronounce that right? Coppola. Who else? OK, well. I'm sorry. That speaks for enough, well enough for itself. Um, and and I'm just going to say, from personal experience in in uh, I, you know the various industries I worked in, um, there's an element of the people person that a manager doesn't have. They can't shake and bake this guy in college and give him the people skills that he needs to have to be a mayor. And a manager is is an altogether different breed of cat, and 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 we don't, you know, you need somebody that's that's like a people person. I'm going to point to one good example, Tim Mathis. He's 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 personable. He's outgoing. He looks at the peop at the town as a community of human beings, not a bunch of numbers and and uh, statistics and and assets or resources. He's he's he treats people as human beings and. That's the first thing I felt like I was being treated like a human being. And so I greatly appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I want to get the feeling that, you know, there's a future here that, that this cabal or this cartel that has been holding all the, the, the cards that's been in charge uh, is, is either going to get get the message and and change their tune, or or go find another job. I mean, it's as far as I'm concerned, that's 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 the product that this customer is is uh, is here to, to buy or not buy. It's based on what what they're what they're putting out, and uh, that's that's where I, I kind of leave it right there. End of end of. Uh, D uh, discussion. <laughs> I just want to take an opportunity to reply because Eric, you've made some really great points, and um, you know we have people that have been in this city for much, much longer than we have. We've been here going on 19, 20 years, and I will tell you for the for the first time in a long time, although we've talked a lot of negative things, I see our city moving out of that direction, and I do. I do hold this man who owns a hair salon, a used car dealership, and a martini bar highly um, in, in charge in making it do it. Don Ryan has really taken the impetus and started moving forward. And I, I think for the first time, many of us, we see Pops literally in the last year, 
has changed dramatically. We've gone to those meetings for a long time, and and there was a couple that's been looking to buy here in the town, and he came to the meeting and was excited about Port Orchard. And after the meeting, we stood and talked for a night. It, it was, I said, look at the clock. And he said, what? And I, I said, what time is it? It's 9.30. Well, the meetings get over at 9. And I said, a year ago, there wouldn't have been another person standing in here still talking. There's a new energy that has come into town that I think is positive, and we can keep it running. People like you showing up and being here and paying attention. And so, um, and I love the fact we've had times this meeting had 50 people in it. But I think it is that taking, we know there's some negative, but moving forward with the positive, get it on those that are wanting to take it where it needs to go, encouraging. And um, I'm grateful for people like Beck and Fred. Fred commits and is in town and is active and is on our council, but his face is seen in the stores and at the events and and he supports what's going on more than just sitting up there he's act you know actually going on and so i think it's hard when you've sat and watched it for a long time but um i think if we put the emphasis on the positive and say this is the direction we want it to go and we make that happen and bring people to come to council meetings get involved it's not the necessarily the funnest evening out but but just you know if we get if you get enough people in here we've proved it over and over and over again you get people in here that say we want this and this is where we want it to be that problem will solve as business grows as it succeeds business buildings can get higher rents there'll be better tenants that process will take place but I'm personally I admit I'm holding my breath a little bit but I'm excited to see what's happening three or four five new businesses will be up and open and running in this town within the next couple months that's good news okay i just wanted to tell everyone there's there's comment cards here downstairs everywhere and uh they're starting to work. I'm receiving them. You don't have to put your name on them if you don't want to, but if you want me to contact you, you have to give me some way to contact you, phone number or your name. Uh, but if you just, just want to make a comment without a name, that's fine too. I like to look at them. So. Um, this gentleman over here was talking about the tattoo parlors and um, other things that he didn't care for downtown. And what started me coming here was our city working on, it's called the Downtown Overlay District, and they worked for a long, long time on the businesses that could be downtown. But now we've come to find out that the way it's written, they can get around moving in. So now we have the three tattoo parlors downtown, and we have the pawn shop downtown, which if you look at the list of businesses that could be downtown in the DOD, were not allowed, but because of the way it's written, so it was supposed to go back to the planning commission, and there again, I, I don't know if it's ever gotten back to you. Yes. Okay, it got back to us, and then it got put on hold because the city council, the, what the last I heard was, is that the city council is going to direct us, and this is a quote, as near as I can make it, they are going to direct us what specific areas we can look at. Okay, so that brings up a di another point. The Planning Commission used to have quite a bit of autonomy in what we actually look at. You know, what we, you know, we set our own agenda for the year. The council does have an input on that. And, and ultimately, the council does have the authority to direct the council as they have the authority to direct staff and to, to direct the mayor. That is a technical authority because they are the legislative body of the city. Okay. One of the things that Tadina and I talked about just sitting here is that her issues, I'd like her to bring that up to 
at our next planning commission meeting. And I want to put together an agenda from the planning commission to send to the council. And Jerry, when you're, if you can send me an email or send me and the mayor an email or whatever that kind of fleshes that out, it, it will add weight to when we put our agenda together and forward it, that it has some more validity. It's like at the last council meeting, you know, there were half a dozen people like it's been talked about. And actually the council did something about that. Now, I don't know whether that was because, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to say that. What I was going to say is because those people are friends of some of the people they're, on the council. Well, they're prominent people in the community. I'm just calling it like it really is instead of being nice. <laughs> I don't care whether I'm on tape. That's why I said it the way I said it. <laughs> so my point is, is make a, actually document it and, it, and it will get in there, and then when we present that document, maybe it'll have some teeth, and hopefully next year there'll be council members who are more receptive to what the Planning Commission wants to do. Well, next one, the next time we have one of these, I want people to really level with me, you know, because they've been holding back. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. no. Well, um, thanks, everyone. Uh, this, uh, please have a cookie or some juice or a cookie and some juice. They're still both out there. And uh, like I say, if you don't eat it now, you, three months is a long time. To, I'm going to bring them back in September. So... <laughs> Thank you.